The member for Bowman. Deputy Chair, it's self-evident that there's strong support for a new disability scheme in this country. It's probably not as obvious to many observers that we're still a long way away from making it happen, despite the strong support at all levels of government. I can't use my time any better today than to tell the stories of Tina, uh, Louisa, Karen and Kimberley, who live in my community and the struggle that they've had up until this time. I don't think I add much to the debate by talking about the Productivity Commission's findings, uh, except to say that in the Masters of Understatement they said that the additional investment of $6.5 billion simply reflects just how bad the current system is. I'd like to emphasise the unexpected nature of uh, a catastrophic event that can lead to lifetime disability, and I'd like to tell Tina's story and read it into Hansard. Tina's daughter is Ava, and she's just five years old, turning six in May, and she is in grade one at our local special school. And she developed completely normally as an 18-month-old little girl until suddenly her milestones reversed. Her skills started to leave her. She began having seizures, and she lost the ability to walk that she had just learnt six months before. She could no longer swallow. She suddenly, obviously, therefore, failed to thrive and lost all hand function and lost all her speech. She was diagnosed then with Rett syndrome, uh, something that is a completely sporadic X chromosomal uh, mutation that happens about one in every 10,000 times. And for this family, the challenge is simply to keep their daughter walking, eating, and still being able to communicate, obviously, without any hand use. So they rely on eye gaze technique, even though those devices are so expensive and they are not covered under the current scheme. They do have some help with the autism package, but there is virtually no flexibility within it. And the limited physiotherapy uh, actually has been excluded until recently for little girls with Rett syndrome. And they dream of a day where they could direct their spending towards things like horse riding for Ava, hydrotherapy, music therapy, or even dance for kids with special needs. But up until now, that has simply not been possible. And that's because a funding body decides these things, where the money can be spent and how it's used. And then, of course, at the age of seven, it's arbitrarily lost altogether. So there's a race now in the next 18 months to access as much service as possible um, to set Ava up as well as they can before she falls into the black hole of having no support at all. The experience for, uh, for this family and for Tina's family is that disability services, if you are not literally begging and desperate and beyond coping, then you don't get the assistance. It sets up a curious world where families have actually have to exaggerate the problems just for the hope of funding, and a situation where families with a disabled member look to each other and wonder whether they are gaming the system or behaving in a way that makes their case more compelling to disability services. And that takes away the sense of consistency and fairness. And a great example was when um, Tina had her second child. And after eight months of virtually no sleep with the second baby, also trying to look after Ava, she was at the end of her rope and she contacted Commonwealth Respite Care Link for some support. And of course, they said, I'm sorry, we can only give you emergency support and you're not eligible. They were then told that if they really wanted it, they'd have to find $500 a week, money that they simply could not budget for. Eventually, in what seemed like a negotiation, they were offered the some support if they would contribute at least $20 a week. And she said yes, even though she didn't have that money. The person who was sent, well-meaning enough, to help her was so large that she couldn't get up and down out of the couch. Uh, she wasn't able to help Ava at all. And she wouldn't pick up the crying baby because she said that's not part of the package. It's not the baby that has the disability. It's not the best $20 that this family ever spent. And they'd love to see a support system that offered more flexibility to allow parents to direct that money uh, where they thought that it could get the most value and support for their individual circumstance. And to give an example of finding how hard it is to find $20 a week, Deputy Speaker, um, uh, this family faces a bill of $7,500 for a paediatric stroller, $3,000 for a paediatric bath, $4,500 uh, for a uh, special needs bike so there can be some exercise for Ava and, of course, a special support chair for feeding and eating at just under $3,000 uh, with no help towards those expenses. We've heard enough in this chamber about uh, the system that we have at the moment. And let's be honest, the political will wasn't there for decades. It's been a perennial fight between Commonwealth and state government and it were these families that we left in the dark and without the assistance they deserve. We know state governments could never handle this on their own, but we chose to leave it like that for a long time. So I speak to the 969 carer payment recipients in my community, to 3,176 individuals who all get a carer allowance. 
And our commitment here is that we won't leave you alone and that together we really can craft a better system, but there is a long way to go. That need for flexibility is one that I heard over and over again. And Karen Howe, who lives in Cleveland, um, asked me to also read her story into the Parliament's Hansard. Her son is eight. His name's Dylan with Williams syndrome, a rare genetic order, disorder uh, that obviously causes global uh, developmental delay. He's non-verbal, completely dependent on his parents to dress him, to toilet him, to even maintain his communication and emotional needs. And he suffers with hyperacusis, meaning he can't even attend large groups like a party or a circus with other kids his own age because he decompensates. Um, his parents have been unable to offer all the services that they know, they see and they feel would make such a difference. That lack of support means that they can't have speech or OT and that they have to do that themselves and ask and, and, and uh, rely on the teacher and a teacher's aide who don't have the training to do just that kind of thing. It's virtually impossible, as they see it, for Dylan uh, to be able to maintain his dignity and to fit into society. Uh, these stories uh, exist the nation over, as was <laughs> emphasised by the previous speaker. But, uh, Deputy Speaker, the reality is that even I, having worked in the health system, I was never exposed to this. I worked in a clinic with people rolling in and rolling out, and every 20th person I had to tell them that their vision could not be saved, that there was no treatment for it. And that was a half hour conversation. But I left those people to return home to their own family members and have those quiet conversations at home with those that they loved, to lie in bed at night and wonder what their future was. Um, that happened over and over again, but as clinicians, we're only just touched very, very uh, peripherally and ephemerally by those experiences. The great benefit of this debate is that I think almost everyone in this chamber now, and thanks to the NDIS campaign, have had real, genuine, one-to-one -one experience, even if it was only for a short period of time, with people struggling uh, with, with these challenges of disability. What hasn't been mentioned, I think, enough in this debate, when we look at the large figures, is that there are significant economic benefits to instituting a system that is way more responsive and liberates those around a person with disability to participate fully and even allows someone with a more mild disability to be part of the real economy. Kimberly Ali is a businesswoman and she lives in my electorate. Uh, she's had to obviously give up her job to care. Um, her and her Marco have had to give up uh, um, at least one job to look after their beautiful six-year-old son who has autism. She's uh, um, dedicated her time to basically endless trips to therapists and trying to broker a path that's best for her son through what's a completely fractured system. Her husband's had to let go of full-time staff in order to pay himself enough to cover their son's therapies, which are roughly you know, $200 to $500 a week. Imagine trying to find that kind of money. Um, her husband leaves, Marco, leaves for work at 6 a.m., returns at 6 p.m., six days a week, just trying to keep their small business running and they've had to have conversations, obviously, about how they can find the extra money that their son needs. Um, in saying that, they describe themselves as the lucky ones. Their son never goes without. They've done everything they can to make sure that he gets a really experienced speech therapist. But it's a sad state of affairs because they know of kids just like their own who simply can't do it because they can't find the money. Evidence shows that ongoing intervention on in autism uh, is, is effective and early intervention is doubly effective. We need to be intervening way before the educational and social deficits compound into people that are obviously way more reliant on social services in the future. Uh, groups like AEIOU will say that with intensive intervention, a whole range of autism, uh, kids living with autism, increase their odds of making it and getting through mainstream education from 30% likelihood to 80% it's a fantastic intervention. Uh, it's a credit to uh, the former Prime Minister for initiating a range of autism packages, which again weren't available until 2008. So now, no matter how financially responsible you are, I hope I've made the case that there's no way to prepare for such a catastrophic event. And the reality is that in those cases, uh, it's almost irrefutable that we need a social system that will compensate for that. I think it's smart in the design of the system that's proposed that we divide up uh, catastrophic injuries related to uh, you know, uh, non-acquired sorry, acquired injuries are looked after by the state in an NIIS that will cost around $835 million a year. We'll have 1,000 new entrants and by 2018 about 30,000 people cared for under that state scheme that will be primarily funded by the insurance uh, premiums that are already being paid. This covers people who have a traumatic accident, be it at home or in the workplace or in simply a public place a motor vehicle accident or the result of some form of um, you know, criminal action. All of these people should be covered 
And it shouldn't be a matter, Speaker, it shouldn't be a matter of what side of the street you live on in Tweed Heads, whether you can access the no-fault care and support uh, scheme that exists in New South Wales, uh, or if you happen to be on the other side of the street and you're a Queenslander where there is no scheme. It shouldn't be the fact that because you live in WA that 85 per cent of care, packages, care package applications are refused. I mean, what an extraordinary number. And for anyone who's looking at the obvious uh, shutout report from 2009, we know that people who are disabled are more likely uh, not to complete school, uh, not to be in the workforce. Uh, we know that they're more reliant on public housing. Uh, they won't have access to decent transport or to respite or to personal services or emergency care or to give you a hand with coordinating the services you need or even access uh, to a guide dog or other therapies. But it is one figure that I think we need to remember. It is one number that you take home from this long series of valuable and, and uh, enlightening speeches. It is this. In a nation where we take pub, uh, mental health so seriously now, at both levels of government, we need to remember that someone who's living with a disability has up to a 50 per cent chance of living also with depression, and that is a far distant number from the 6 per cent of the rest of us. If you have a disability, you have a, a third, 25 to 30 per cent chance of living on or below the poverty line. That's a long way away from the 10 per cent odds that the rest of us face. Structuring a system, of course, has, is going to have large numbers attached to it, and I want to give recognition to Queensland. because. A year ago today, Queensland was the lowest investor in disability support services per the population of all the jurisdictions. And on the 12th of December this year, uh, an important announcement by the Treasurer and the Premier, Campbell Newman, was that Queensland committed to reaching the average spend around the nation. They should be commended for that. This was the largest increase in disability uh, expenditure in Australia's history. And they took the existing $979 million a year of specialty dis disability support services, plus the $200 million a year for associated services, and promised to boost it to $1.77 billion by 2018. That was a courageous step. It's nearly a 50 per cent increase in real terms. And not only that, they committed. The often you see the trickery around the numbers, uh, Deputy Speaker, but they committed to a 4.5 per cent annual increase, which covers both CPI and the significant population growth that we have in Queensland. So credit goes to Queensland, who have already established the Your Life, Your Choice program uh, under the Minister for Disability to already begin this process of uh, un, uh, unfettering uh, service provision and giving uh, those who live with disability more choice. I also wanted to mention, uh, in conclusion, the, the story of Louisa. Um, Louisa has a daughter, Gabby, who's 16 years old, and I really want to allow people to contemplate on the lifetime challenges around disability. Uh, they're not always uh, issues with young children that we might be seeing at special schools, but that other significant transition where a 16 or 17 year old leaves those services that are provided through public education and has to fend for themselves as an adult. Uh, Gabby's 16 years old with Asperger's and ADHD and behavioural issues. And this makes her at time aggressive, Deputy Speaker, and developmental delays and learning issues, which really, really does make socialising really, really difficult. Uh, Gabby gets three hours of support a fortnight for her disability. Uh, there is no such thing as some of the, the impressive uh, schools of support that we see in places like uh, um, Carolina in the US. Uh, there's nothing like this in this country at this stage. And um, the hope of Louisa is that uh, a new scheme could start to facilitate schools that provide intensive support for kids like that. Her other great fear is that at the age of 18, uh, she may not be able to continue caring for her daughter, Gabby. So will she be able to live in assisted housing? That's a massive concern for her. Look, a lot of people blame people like Louisa, and they say, you could have parented differently. Uh, you could have got more help earlier. And that does lead, as she describes, to tremendous guilt, and it makes her at times feel both alone and incredibly abandoned. Well, my message is to, to Kimberly, uh, to Louisa, uh, to Karen, um, uh, to Kimberley, that we in this place will do everything that we can to craft a better system. It's a very, very solemn pledge. It's one that hasn't yet been made um, after decades and decades of waiting. We're sorry that it's taken that long to come to this point. Uh, many of us at a personal level in this place came with very, very different experiences of how the system works. But I am confident to say today that there is a determination and a will and a resolution here to do whatever we can to have a better system and to remove that invisible deprivation. Uh, to take away the feeling that you have of being trapped and isolated, uh, to return you wherever we can, families out there, to real and genuine economic participation, social participation, and to welcome you all back to the privileges that this nation offers able-bodied families.